King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold whose height was 60 cubits and its breadth 6 cubits. He set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Then King Nebuchadnezzar sent to gather the satraps, prefects, and governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the justices, the magistrates, and all the officials of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Then the satraps, the prefects, and the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the justices, the magistrates, and all the officials of the provinces gathered for the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And the herald proclaimed aloud, You are commanded, O peoples, nations, and languages, that when you hear the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music, you are to fall down and worship the golden image that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall immediately be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. Therefore, as soon as all the peoples heard the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, and bagpipe, and every all kind of music, the peoples, nations, and languages fell down and worshipped the golden image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Therefore, at that time, certain Chaldeans came forward and maliciously accused the Jews. They declared to King Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. You, O king, have made a decree that every man who hears the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music shall fall down and worship the golden image. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. There are certain Jews whom you have appointed over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, pay no attention to you. They do not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in furious rage, commanded that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be brought. So they brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar answered and said to them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the golden image that I have set up? Now if you are ready, when you hear the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music to fall down and worship the image that I have made, well and good. But if you do not worship, you shall immediately be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. And who is the God who will deliver you out of my hands? Stop there for now. Let's uh, look at this verse that is a good one to remember here. Let's say this together. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. 1 Peter 2.12 Okay, to this day, persecution of people who believe in the true God has not ceased. In fact, in many places, it's increased. It's gotten worse. There's a map that I have on a screen here. This is where, these are the countries where Christians are persecuted. The red is the worst countries, then orange, then yellow. And uh, in these countries, if you say that Jesus is your Lord and Savior, then you're in trouble. And uh, for some people in some of these places, that can mean you might die. Especially if the wrong people found out. In just last year, just 2017, there were 3,066 Christians killed, at least that we know of. There were 1,252 abducted. There were 1,020 either raped or sexually harassed. And there were 793 churches that were attacked. That's according to Open Doors. And the truth is is that the Christian faith is at odds with the world. The things that Jesus was and what He stood for are not 
really conducive to the world's ideas, its plans, or this world's order. The Christian faith is a radical, dangerous belief if you hold it. And just because we live in a safe corner of the world doesn't mean that that's not true for most people in most places. In verse 1 there, King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold, it says. Now, just a little bit of context. If you know the previous chapter, if you know the story that came before that, King Nebuchadnezzar had this dream of this statue, and it had a head of gold, it had arms and chest of silver, and other kinds of metals going down. And Daniel interpreted this dream, and he says, you are the head of gold, and this is your kingdom. But then after you, there's going to be another kingdom, and then another one, and another one, and so on. And then there was this rock that was cut out, not from human hands, but it came and it smashed that statue, and that statue just became like dust, but that rock grew and filled the whole world. So, in other words, King... Maybe he didn't use these words, but the implication was that your kingdom is, is great. It's of gold, but it's going to come to an end. There's going to be other kingdoms. And there's going to be one kingdom that's going to come, smash all the other ones, that's going to fill the whole world. So now, this was, there's kind of a picture of, of that dream there. So in chapter 2, the king learned his kingdom of gold would not last. And... If you're a king, if you're a kingdom, you, uh, you don't like to hear that very much. So, you want your kingdom, and as a king, yourself, you want to preserve your kingdom. So, hearing that your kingdom is not going to last is not what you want to hear. So, in verse 1 here, where it says, King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of all gold... An all gold image is a statement that his kingdom is going to last forever. There's not going to be any other kingdoms coming after that. The image is of all gold. So he's kind of making a statement by setting up this image. He's saying his kingdom is the greatest, it's going to last forever, it's never going to be overtaken, and he's also kind of proclaiming that he is the master of his destiny. So, I had this dream that there's going to be these other kingdoms that are going to come, but you know what? Now that I've been warned about that, now I can take precautions to make sure that that won't happen. So, I'm going to make sure that my kingdom lasts forever. It's going to achieve his own immortality this way. So, then in verse 2, it talks about how he summoned all these people to the dedication of this image. As king of many different peoples and nations and tongues, Nebuchadnezzar requires loyalty. If you're a king over a lot of different kinds of people who worship maybe different kinds of gods, you know, have different customs, and they're different in many ways, you need something that's going to unify all of them. And in particular, you need yourself to be able to unify them. So, if you're going to rule a bunch of different kinds of people who have a lot of differences, you need something that's going to unify them and particularly unify them underneath you. So he's requiring all of the officials of all of his provinces to pledge loyalty to his mission, his plan to make this kingdom last forever with him, of course, as the king. That's what's going on here. And then verse 6, there's the warning. Whoever does not fall down and worship shall immediately be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. This wasn't an arbitrary punishment. A fiery furnace was most likely the smelting furnace for the gold of that image. It was probably really close to the image, nearby. So that in making this image, they can just supply, have already supplied gold that's right there. 
And, so verse 6, if you don't worship the image, the implication here is that you are going to be consumed by it. You are going to get thrown into this furnace that goes to make the gold that goes to that image. In other words, you, your body is going to become part of this image. This image is going to consume you. If you want to go against this image, then you're going to be a part of it. It's going to devour you. One way or another, you are going to serve this image. You are going to belong to it. You're going to become part of its goal if you refuse to worship. Okay, so we have Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And they are summoned before King Nebuchadnezzar, and they're said, okay, what's going on here? You, you heard the music, you heard the warnings, and you're not worshiping. What's going on here? What's your problem? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they had many reasons to compromise here. Many reasons to kind of, well, maybe it's, maybe it's okay. Well, for one, they were just promoted in this kingdom to some pretty significant positions. In uh, the last verse of the previous chapter, it says they were promoted. And right after their promotion, they're going to defy the king. That's not really a good, a good plan. I mean, if you're in this position, this high position in the kingdom, a pagan kingdom for that matter, you can use your great influence for God, couldn't you? I mean, if you're, if you're in this spot where you can make a lot of decisions, then you could benefit a lot of different people, and you could maybe bring God to these people, couldn't you? If you don't worship this image, then you're going to die, and what good are you then? I mean, if you're going to be a part of this image, if it's going to consume you, if you're not worshiping, I mean, what's, what's the point? I mean, God Himself commands obedience to government, doesn't He? You no, know, give to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. You know, God, the authorities are God's servants to do you good, but if you don't, then be afraid. They don't bear the sword for nothing. They are God's agents to bring wrath on the wrongdoer. So maybe maybe it was okay. Maybe maybe they could maybe they could maybe they could just maybe they could just kind of instead of just bowing, maybe they could just, you know, nod their head a little bit. I mean, the king is obviously trying to be nice to them. I mean, the warning was if you don't, you're going to immediately go into the furnace. He's giving them a second chance. He's he's trying to be nice. He's he's meeting it halfway. Maybe, maybe it's okay. Well, we as believers are exiles in this world. And even though we are not faced with fiery furnaces as such, we still are faced with many opportunities to compromise in our lives, our worship of God. Believers are exiles, and Babylon wants to make us Babylonian. This is what we talked about last time. Living in Babylon, Babylon wants to make us after Babylon. They want to make us their way. And they want us to serve their gods. And in our case, that's the gods of feeling good and just getting along especially in this country where you have a lot of people who are very different in many ways. And in this time, there's a lot of polarization in politics especially. There's a lot of people who really don't like each other. We need people to get along. So getting along at all costs is kind of held as a a virtue around here at this time. Feeling good and getting along the world will always be threatened by the true God. The true God is a challenge to this world's order and its desires. It always has been and it always will be. So if you believe the God of Jesus Christ, 
and you believe things that this world does not like. You believe that there's only one God and only one Lord Jesus Christ. That's not very good for a pluralistic society where there's many different kinds of beliefs. Believing that there's just one God, then that's kind of like saying everybody else is wrong. And who are you to disrupt all of this system that we've created here where we all get along? If you believe that there's an absolute right and wrong, that's offensive. Who are you to say that what somebody else does is wrong? How dare you? If you believe that salvation is by grace alone, then that kind of flies against the can-do spirit of America. If you believe in original sin, then... That really flies in the face of a lot of people. I just read an article this week about how teaching, teaching that to kids is terribly, inherently dangerous for their development. But the truth is, is that all of us, young and old, we need Christ for our salvation. All of us. True believers are faced with compromising all the time in our worship of God or in our allegiance to the true God. But true believers would rather die than worship another God. There are certain things that true believers will never compromise on. Not at all. Let's look at what happens here. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If this be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace and He will deliver us out of your hand, O King. But if not, be it known to you, O King, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Firm line in the sand there. Not happening. Then Nebuchadnezzar was filled with fury And the expression of his face was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He ordered the furnace heated seven times more than it was usually heated. And he ordered some of the mighty men of his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and to cast them into the burning fiery furnace. Then these men were bound in their cloaks, their tunics, their hats, and their other garments, and they were thrown into the burning fiery furnace. Because the king's order was urgent and the furnace overheated, the flame of the fire killed those men who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell bound into the burning, fiery furnace. Then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished and rose up in haste. He declared to his counselors, Did we not cast three men bound into the fire? They answered and said to the king, True, O king. He answered and said, But I see four men, unbound, walking in the midst of the fire, and they are not hurt. And the appearance of the fourth is like a son of the gods. Then Nebuchadnezzar came near to the door of the burning fiery furnace. He declared, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out and come here. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out from the fire, and the satraps, the prefects, the governors, And the king's counselors gathered together and saw that the fire had not had any power over the bodies of those men. The hair of their heads was not singed, their cloaks were not harmed, and no smell of fire had come upon them. Nebuchadnezzar answered and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and delivered his servants, who trusted in him and set aside the king's command and yielded up their bodies rather than serve and worship any god except their own god. Therefore, I make a decree, any people, nation, or language that speaks anything against the god of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be torn limb from limb and their houses laid in ruins, for there is no other god who is able to rescue in this way. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. Let's look at the screen here and let's answer this together. What does the Lord require 
in the first commandment that I, not wanting to endanger my very salvation, avoid and shun all idolatry, magic, superstitious rites, and prayer to saints or to other creatures, that I sincerely acknowledge the only true God, trust Him alone, look to Him for every good thing, humbly and patiently, love Him, fear Him, and honor Him with all my heart. In short, that I give up anything rather than go against His will in any way. That's quite a, it's quite a commitment there. I give up anything rather than go against His will in any way. If you call Jesus Lord, if He is your Lord, then that means that He is your highest Lord. You can't serve Him halfway. And so, if He is your Lord, that means that you would give up anything rather than go against His will in any way. And that includes giving up your life. That's quite a commitment. Are you up for that? Can you handle that? If you were Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and you were told to bow down before an image, would you refuse? Even if it meant certain death? Every love and loyalty requires sacrifice to maintain. Whatever you love, whatever you are loyal to, you need to make sacrifices to maintain that love or that loyalty. No matter what it is, and even if you don't worship the true God, you love something, you're committed to something, and you have to make sacrifices to maintain that love and that commitment. So, for example, the pressure of work is going to invade time for things like marriage and family. What's going to give? You have to make a decision. Or helping kids with homework is going to come at odds with your hobbies, the things you want to do. What's going to give? You have to make a decision. So, in the same way, there are things in this world that are going to challenge your commitment and your love for Jesus Christ. What is going to give? You have to make a decision. What's going to sacrifice? And if you call Jesus your Lord, then that means you would, rather go, you would rather give up anything rather than go against His will in any way. Never compromise faith in Christ or worship of God. Of all the things that you can compromise, don't ever compromise there. For some, saying Christ is Lord, following Christ as Lord means losing your job, Mockery by friends, being thrown out by your husband or your parents into the street, beatings by angry mobs while police just watch, being run out of town with nowhere to go, arrest and imprisonment, never seeing your children again, being forced into marriage to somebody of another religion, torture to reveal who witnessed to you, who shared Jesus with you, and execution. You saw the, the map of all those countries. There's a lot of those stories that come out of those countries if you look for them. They don't usually make it on the front page. But there's a lot of stories of people who are giving up everything, literally, including their own lives and their own families and their well-being to follow Jesus. Jesus said this, Everyone who acknowledges Me before men, I will acknowledge before My Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies Me before men, I will deny before My Father who is in heaven. It's quite a, it's quite a, quite a challenge. Quite a warning. 
And then he goes on in a couple more verses to say this. This is in your Bible reading tracks this week. Whoever loves his father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever loves his son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. That's what, those are words directly from Jesus. It's quite, a, it's quite a big deal to follow Jesus, to call him your Lord. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they had full confidence though. Maybe you noticed that in verse 17. They actually used the words, He will deliver us out of your hand. He is going to do it. There was no doubt in their minds that God would deliver them. None. They were, they were fully confident, God is going to deliver us out of your hand. That's, that's the way it is. It's going to happen. They, they use words that this is going to happen. And then, but I love verse 18 too. They said, but if not, even if he doesn't, that's not going to change anything. It doesn't matter if God saves us from your furnace or not. Because one, either way, we're still not going to worship. We're still not going to bow down. The line's in the sand. Boundary is there. Not crossing it. Do what you have to do. But if not, verse 18, true faith perseveres for better or worse. Their allegiance to God was not conditional on their deliverance. It didn't matter whether God was going to save them or not. They were ready to die in that fiery furnace if God was so willed. And there's a lot of people who have to at least, if not declare this, they have to at least think this. God might not deliver me out of the hands of these people here. Or the, this government or this mob. In Hebrews 11, it talks about the heroes of faith. And it talks about how some were victorious and how they were delivered. And it talks about how some were not delivered. But how they all were heroes of faith. So, for example, um, time would fail me to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, and David, Samuel and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, enforced justice, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, they became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight, women received back their dead by resurrection, deliverance there, but not for everybody. Some were tortured, refusing to accept release so that they might rise again to a better life. Others suffered mocking and flogging, even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawed in two. They were killed with the sword. Not everybody was delivered. But whether by deliverance or suffering, as our song says that we sing, faith is the victory. Even if Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego would have perished in that furnace, their statement, He will deliver us from your hand, would still be true. Because God's deliverance is not always physical. It wasn't for Jesus on the cross. Jesus prayed that this cup would be taken from Him, and it wasn't. It wasn't. He died on the cross. He died that, that death. But He rose again. He was still victorious, even though He paid the ultimate price. And if you are ever put into a situation where you have to choose between your God and your life, even if you die, you are still victorious, just like Jesus on the cross. And then in verse 25, Nebuchadnezzar says, I see four men unbound walking in the midst of the fire, and they are not hurt, and the appearance of the fourth is like a son of the gods. A son of the gods. I mean, he wasn't monotheistic. He believed in all kinds of gods. 
That fourth person, though, we would know today as the pre-incarnate Christ. That was Jesus there. And they didn't have it, the name Jesus yet, but looking back, that's, that's who it was. The son of one of the gods, or the son of the God. It's what you call a Christophany, an appearance of the Son of God before the incarnation of Jesus Christ. Jesus was with them in that fiery furnace. God doesn't keep us from the furnace, but He walks with us in it. He doesn't keep us from the furnace. Even though He delivered them, they still were cast in there. They still had to be bound by the strongest men in the army, and they still had to walk towards this blazing inferno that they were going to get thrown into. They still had to have that anticipation to be helpless and get pushed and pushed and pushed towards this this fiery furnace. And to think, what's going to happen? Is God going to deliver us? Like we think He will? There's a man named Milan in Bangladesh. He was raised a Muslim and became a Christian. And uh, that's maybe the worst thing. It's one thing if you're in a Muslim land to be born a Christian and raised a Christian, but if you were a Muslim and you become a Christian, you're marked. He says this, I sold clothing in the local market and began placing some Christian books in my shop for other Christians. When Muslim men heard of this, they would walk into my shop and just take shirts, pants, and socks from the shelf without paying for them. If I asked for money, they threatened to beat me. We are going through many problems, but we still have Jesus Christ. Jesus is walking with him in his trials. We have peace through him, and we have the hope that when we die, we will go to heaven. There was a woman in Syria where all of this civil war is going on and all of this ISIS stuff is going on here. And she was being baptized. And right before that, she says, I lost my home, I lost my furniture, I lost everything, but I won the Lord as my Savior. There was a woman in Ethiopia who was there during the the communist rule there. And uh, they forced her to run across these sharp stones so that her, her feet were all bleeding. And then they threw her into a prison cell that was so tightly packed that nobody could move, and it was full of human waste. And she was there for a year. And she says this, Jesus was there in the midst of the human waste, in the humiliation, in the blood and stench. Jesus was there. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that wasn't just one story that happened one time a long time ago. This is a story that replays again and again and again whenever God's people follow Him into suffering and maybe even death. Jesus is with those people whenever they are called to face that. So for us too, don't compromise. When it comes to worship and service to the Lord, don't compromise there. No matter what the cost is, don't compromise because Christ is inside the furnace. Whatever furnace might be in front of you, whatever threat might be there, Christ is there. And He might not keep you from getting thrown into it, but He's going to walk with you in it. And whether you perish or whether you come out unscathed, you will have His victory. Let's bow our heads and let's pray. Lord God, our our Father in Heaven, it's amazing what You do for Your servants who are willing to sacrifice anything because of they love and their, their following of You. Lord, please make us that way. 
Give us the resolve of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego that, that doesn't compromise when it comes to you. We pray that we would have hearts that are willing to give up anything rather than go against your will in any way. Lord, give us that resolve by the power of your Spirit. And when we do have to go through a furnace of some kind, Lord, open our eyes to see that you are there walking with us. In Jesus' name, amen.